What's up, everybody? Welcome in. It's a special one. It's Sunday night here when I'm recording this. We're going to be at a Universal tomorrow for Maverick's birthday. Uh, but a lot of you guys sent me this at the end of last week. I watched it this weekend, and it was a sentencing class, right? Judge Doro, another sentencing. We watched her sentence, Daryl Brooks. We watched a little bit of this eye drop homicide trial where the defendant was convicted after saying it was a suicide, having these fake notes, all sorts of things that she tried to present, and then issues with her lawyers. And guess what? She's got a different lawyer here for sentencing. No surprise there after how all that went. If you want to check out those videos, we have a playlist. Uh, I don't know if it's called the Visine trial or eyedrop trial, but we have a couple videos. But this sentencing hearing was one for the ages. Judge Doro tells us exactly what she really thinks while also offering truth and grace, in my opinion, in a way only she can. But there was also some real eyebrow raising things that she said about streaming of trials and what this is like and whether she thinks this is a good thing or a bad thing and when it really started and clicked for her. And I thought we can learn so much and have so much to talk about here. It's about an hour and 20 minutes. We're not going to watch the whole thing. We'll probably watch about 40 minutes of it. I clip out some parts that, um, where she really digs into the facts. Like, you know, this witness said that, that witness said that we know she was convicted. We know those facts were deemed correct or at least correct enough in the jury's mind to convict Jesse, the defendant of killing her friend and person that she was the caretaker of and who apparently loved her and trusted her. Really, really sad trial. Um, and sentencing is a day of justice. And I, I think it's cool whenever we see justice served. And But I love the way that Judge Doro did it, okay? She was tough, she was heavy-handed, but also gracious and um, had some mercy on the end, honestly. I, so much so that I think some of you may not agree with it. And I can't wait to hear what you think when we watch this together. Make sure you guys hit the like button if you haven't already. A lot of you asked for this, so hopefully you enjoy it. Um, let me know your questions in the live chat or the comments, uh, but let's get to it. About the delays. Because honestly, I wanna make sure that any trial, especially a homicide trial, is done right the first time. It's of no benefit to anyone if a trial, if convictions get reversed on appeal. It happens sometimes. There's advances or new evidence or whatever the case may be. You complain, for example, about my protective order. And I think little do you realize, not only did I put that in place for the integrity of these proceedings, it was put in place to protect you. See, I've sat in the shoes of Attorney Jones. I didn't. Attorney Jones at this point is her defense attorney. And what's interesting about this is she says, you know, you complained about my rulings. You complained about the timing. You complained about how long it took to get here. A lot of criminal defendants do, and it is frustrating. This happened in 2021. So it took about two years. Two years, I think, ish to go to trial, which you know, isn't horribly long in some of the cases we followed, but not a snap of the fingers. Um, she talks about a protective order, how that was actually done to protect her. And then she's going to talk about, you know, it being live streamed multiple times, multiple comments about live stream, how it can affect the future, how it's affecting now, how it affected this trial. But also really cool, Judge Dora, we already knew this about her. But one of the reasons I think I enjoy watching her is she's pretty balanced because she's been a prosecutor and she's been a criminal defense attorney. Not a ton of judges have. Um, so I think that perspective is really great when it comes to sentencing because she knows how each attorney and then obviously how the judge feels in situations like this. Like when there were surprises. As an attorney, as a defense attorney, I wanted to control the narrative as best as I could to protect my client and his or her rights. Now, when I was on the other side in the state's table or at the state's table, I used to train police officers on confessions. I love confessions. Why do I love confessions? make my job easier as a prosecutor. So I have this unique ability that really not a lot of judges have to look at both sides and now really the third side as a judge and kind of see what's going on. And so every time you make an extra statement, you complicate things for your defense team. And we've talked about that a million times. When defendants talk and their own words can be used against them, they usually dig their hole deeper. They make things more difficult. They make it easier on the state to either use a confession or show how it's inconsistent or why did they tell a lie, the big lie. So many cases come down to the big lie the defendant told. That's your right to do it. But I wasn't going to have that happen until this case. I, I didn't want to have extra judicial statements any outside a court trial or in this case of sentencing as well that could impugn the integrity of these proceedings. It's not good for you. It's not good for the case. I want to make sure we have a jury that's fair and impartial. And in this particular case, there were extra steps taken because of the interest. You may not have, I guess, liked, I'm gathering from your statements here today, that there were cameras in the courtroom and that this was on court TV and law and crime and other things. But here's the thing. 
I learned during and following the pandemic when we shut. Here we go. A big revelation from a judge who's had multiple trials streamed and watched by thousands of people. What does she think? Does she like it? Does she not like it? How does it affect our system? Is it good? Is it bad? People listen up because same time this channel started basically was during the pandemic, actually just, you know, six months, a year after the pandemic started. That's when this channel started for similar reasons. And I think this is such a good explanation and a cool explanation to hear from a judge literally living it. Cut down courts or at least limited them to a great degree. What I learned is I started doing live streaming because that was a way for people to still be engaged, to watch what's going on, to keep our courts open and operating during a time of uncertainty. People were very interested. The court system and the legal system is critiqued and criticized all the time for not being transparent. So by for people thinking it's too difficult to understand and being too scared to take part in it and, oh, it's just not worth it and I just can't do it, I'm going to get screwed. And guess what? Some of that is true. But some of it is not. And that's what's important about watching this stuff together and I, how I like you know hanging out with you guys, answering questions, trying to explain things, trying to dispel myths, trying to tell you, no, that is the real hard truth, whether something's worth it or not. And Judge Doro agrees. We can learn and see this stuff together. So many people have a problem with the system. How do we fix those problems? Which problems are real? Which ones aren't? We are literally watching real trials with real people, real justice, real problems together. By having cameras in the courtroom, when there is that interest, I believe it fosters transparency. 100%. It's not about sensationalizing this. I did a very, very extensive trial order on that to make sure that didn't happen. And obviously, I think that can depend on the case. That can depend on the lawyers. That can depend on the judge. But if you control it the right way, to me, and as long as we, as citizens watching this, don't abuse the ability to do this and abuse the people involved and make the internet a horrible place, we can learn. It can be a good thing. We can see the truth. There can be transparency, which is what everyone should want in this country and across the world, in my opinion. You're not wrong that there's an interest and that people do different things with that interest. We are seeing trials televised more and more. People are fascinated with the legal system. I had a request and I granted it. Nothing more, nothing less. But some of my rules and requirements were meant to make sure that nonetheless, Things were fair and impartial. And, and when we watch these cases in the future and we hear these judges dealing with cameras in the courtroom because it's going to happen, and we've seen Judge Newman handle it one way, Judge Boyce handle it one way, this judge handle it, Judge Gull in the Delphi case handle it a very different way. We learn and we get to see which judges we maybe agree with a little more or respect a little more their ability to control the courtroom while also allowing transparency. And people seeing there's nothing to hide, but there's also there shouldn't be sensationalization about this stuff either. It's a hard balance. It's a hard balance. I'm not going to condemn judges for, for being careful to make sure they protect the party's rights. Fair and impartial doesn't mean you're going to agree with everything that I do. Fair and impartial doesn't mean you're going to agree with how a jury decides this case, how it's investigated, how it's presented. There's a lot of law on evidence. There's a lot of case law, values of it, on what comes in, what doesn't come in. Some of those rules impacted evidence coming into this case. Other things are beyond my control, whether the state chooses to offer something or not, or whether your own attorneys choose to offer something or not. But a courtroom isn't a free-for-all either. I do my very best to ensure that relevant evidence comes into the courtroom and reliable evidence. I love it. I mean, that's what we've been preaching on this channel. That's what we've talked about so much. Everything's not going to come in. You may not agree with judges' answers, but it's got to be relevant and reliable evidence. And we've broken that down so many times together. And I think a lot of you guys get it now and you're explaining it to your friends. And that's kind of how people learn as a society, right? That guess what? This isn't coming in because it's hearsay. Well, why? Why isn't hearsay just coming in? Because it's not as reliable. Can't be cross-examined. Get that person on the stand if it's really important and we need them to testify. And if they're unavailable, there are exceptions to hearsay. It's, it's really fun to see a judge explain a, a lot of the stuff that's just so important in our system. I'm going to jump a couple minutes ahead and it's kind of wild. She starts talking about eye drops and how we didn't even know this drug and then we're dangerous. What do we know about it? And one of the ways she got some exposure to it as the judge is kind of wild, but judges are people too. They live a normal life too, and they get exposed to things in different ways. Kind of like a lot of you have been exposed to the legal system, I think, in a similar way to Judge Doro. In the literature, accidental or malicious? 
no known literature about people dying from voluntarily ingesting it for a suicide. Why is that? Because that's a big question. I, I think it needs to be answered. And that's because I think it's the last way anyone would ever commit suicide because of how it affects the human body. It makes people sick. You weren't the first person to think about tetrahydrazoline. There have been movies and even Law and Order episodes, or an episode that I happened to see at one point, where there's some poisoning. We know from Henry Spiller, your own witness, he encouraged. Did you catch that? She watched a Law and Order episode where this was a thing. I mean, listen, so much of this is just being mixed and, and happening together and realistic situations and real lawyers getting involved in shows and documentaries and, and movies. Um, some of it's realistic, some of it's not. That's what we've talked about a ton. But when there's a law and order episode about something that's not a ton of the literature about, not a known real way to commit a homicide, but the judge in a homicide case sees it, that it is something that could be possible, then hears from experts and how this is actually legit, scientifically speaking, and can happen. And it kind of comes into play in this trial. It's just mind-blowing to me, legitimately mind-blowing to me that the judge is referencing law and order in a real case, a real trial where someone's life was really taken and this person is really going to prison over it. Oof. Encourage the FBI to look into it or get it on a list because of its use related to sexual assault, that malicious ingestion, right, a poisoning. But like I said, at its core, it's a sedative. And, and how does it affect the system? Um, during Dr. No, I think it was uh, Ms. Kasinko's uh, testimony, she talked about how it in, when ingested, and I, obviously unknowingly, right, it's odorless, it's tasteless, you can give it to someone without them ever knowing it, it can reduce inhibitions, it, cr it creates, uh, causes someone to be lethargic, um, it has a significant impact when in large amounts that shouldn't be in one system on to CNS depressant, right, so ultimately it affects breathing and heart rate and brain functioning and can lead to death. After listening and seeing and reading through all the evidence, just like the jury did. And I don't know what they ultimately or why they ultimately concluded it's a homicide. They don't have to explain their verdict. They just render. It's almost like she knows this stuff's going to end up online too. She uses the word homicide, not the M word or the K word, which I thought's interesting throughout the sentencing. They're a verdict. They're all having to agree. But as I saw everything, I have to ask out loud. It's a rhetorical question, but were you poisoning Lynn Hernan all along, following your release from prison? No. I'm not asking for an answer. This is my time. So do not interrupt. A little zing there. She's like, no, she's like, I'm not asking for an answer. She literally said it was a rhetorical question before she asked. And she said, basically, be quiet. It's my time to talk. You got to present all. Basically, her witnesses were trashing the victim's family, trashing law enforcement, trashing the legal system, trashing the judge, everybody else's fault but the defendant and the judge had had enough. And you could tell with some of her other comments that she is just not having it. But there's evidence that basically she's been doing this a lot longer than people may have known, taking advantage of her, stealing from her, thinking she was never going to get caught. And then she did. Got me. She got markedly sicker following your reinsertion in her life on a daily basis ultimately ending up in the hospital in September of 2018. Unexplained. Couldn't figure out what was going on. But what do we know? She got better. What could not have been happening in the hospital? Someone poisoning her with THZ. Too much risk associated with that. Cameras, whatever it may be. And I think that gave you the green light. You said it went undetected because what I think was happening is that you were using it to control Lynn Hernan, to steal from her to gain control of her accounts. I think you targeted her. I agree with the state's assessment on that. With the total and utter lack of remorse, you may be surprised at what the sentence ends up being because she's looking at life, obviously, without the possibility of parole. That's what she's looking for. Intentional homicide and multiple thefts. That's not what she gets. Spoiler alert. The perfect victim. No children, no parents. They were deceased with a fair amount of money. Why do I say that? Well, your past matters. Your past convictions for forgery, uttering, and misappropriation of personal identifying information matter. Because I'm a big proponent and believer that the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. Those are what we call crimes of moral turpitude. She's willing to lie 
She's willing to cheat. She's willing to steal. And she did it here as her motive for this homicide. That's not to say people can't change. Either. But, but of course, Judge Duro throws this in there, which I also love and I try to do myself. Of future behavior is past behavior. That's not to say people can't change. But we know you targeted people. And from my perspective, some very, in a very aggravated way, because you, it's really easy to say, well, those convictions happened in 2011 and this didn't happen until 2018. But you were revoked once following being in prison for about a year. It was one year of initial confinement, three years of extended supervision on each of those counts. So basically what she said is the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. And that's absolutely a fact. But that doesn't mean people are irredeemable. It doesn't mean they can't change. It doesn't mean they can't be rehabilitated. It doesn't mean they can't get better. We're not going to be fools. We're not going to close our eyes at people's wrongdoing. We hope for the best, prepare for the worst. And if we're going to predict, we're going to predict and use the things we have to predict. I love the way she uh, she explained that. All right, I'm going to jump ahead about another minute here. Don't know. Do I believe this was a suicide? Absolutely not. So it's like kind of giving her thoughts. Like the defendant continues to maintain her innocence and says it was a suicide. It's like, I I'm not buying it. There's a lot of holes in the stories that you have told. I think you think you're smarter than everyone in this courtroom. All of your statements come after you get information that you now have to explain. Those letters, no way Lynn Hernan wrote those either herself or willingly. Or willingly. And I think that's supported by the thefts in this case. It's supported when you understand the, how tetrahydrazoline affects her, affects individuals. And that why do people choose it for a uh, to assault someone because it can impair them. It can make them lethargic. It can make them lose their own inhibitions. But really, in those circumstances, with that malicious intent, is to control someone. So again, she's just telling her, all the arguments you're making, I'm not buying it. Every time a new piece of information would come out, you'd try to find a way to explain it. You'd create things that didn't exist before, like letters or statements or you know evidence that doesn't really exist. Just hammering. That she doesn't believe her a bit. She thinks the jury got this right. She thinks she absolutely did this to the victim. And she wants her to know it. Hammering her. And again, can this be an appellate issue? Was the judge unfair? Was she biased based on her sentencing comments? Will this be something that comes up? Usually it's not going to be a great argument for an appeal. But we've heard defendants argue it in the past. And I'm sure it's going to be part of something that she argues. All right. Jumping ahead about another minute. I'm not here to tell you it's perfect every step along the way. We're a system filled with human beings. The state proved their case beyond a reasonable doubt. That's what makes the system that we have in the United States so great. I'm not here to tell you it's perfect every step along the way. We're a system filled with human beings. But I don't see this as one of those cases where it's just an all out, let's get Jesse Kraszewski. There's no reason for anyone here to make anything up. You are the common denominator that brings all of us here today. It is your actions, not theirs, and it's not Lynn's. I find it interesting that you criticize people like Anthony Poza, Kareem Poza, Jim Kelleher, and others for not knowing Lynn, for not getting her help. Lynn is for, the you know, you criticize them for saying, well, she wasn't suicidal. They didn't know her. They weren't close to her in the last those are, year of her life. And those are basically her extended family members that, that she criticized. But ironically, you want us to believe all the statements that you've made. And yet you'll back off and say, but I wish I could have done more. I wish I would have seen more. I, I have these regrets because I didn't get her more help. I don't think you can hold those beliefs together. I think they're opposed to each other. I think it's a convenient position to take when you criticize them. And yet you can't go so far as to say, well, I saw it all. You have to stop short of that. Otherwise you couldn't claim that you didn't know she was suicidal. And of course we know that story changed over time. You are, I think, very upset over this thing about Whitnall Park. Here's the thing, you were in custody, okay? I don't know if, it's very, very rare for police to take someone out of custody. But what they did was pretty amazing. They got you on what we call a FaceTime call, some type of video. So she said that there was some evidence in this park that would exonerate her. She needed to be taken out to show them where it was. They didn't do that, but they went there, FaceTimed her to try to find it. Again, giving her the benefit of the doubt, protecting the rights of the defendant. I really respect that. Shocker, they didn't find it. From their conference room at the jail to direct individuals. You want us to believe this evidence that exonerates you exists. And yet you had what? 
October, November, December, January, February, March, April, May, June, up to July 8th. And it- A lot of people wonder, like, what do judges think when it seems so obvious defendants are just slinging BS, throwing whatever they can up against the wall? Like, what do judges think? Well, it's sentencing sometimes. Judges let you know when they think. Throughout the life of the case, she knew Jesse Krzyzewski and her defense team were just slinging BS, especially Jesse. Because her defense team doesn't know if it's true or false or if that you know exonerating evidence exists. If it does, they obviously want to get it. But the judge's thoughts were confirmed basically on how it all resulted. Any point in time to go get it, if it really existed. You had all the opportunity in the world to make sure if that evidence existed, to secure it in a way that was accessible. Not in the ground, at a park. Doesn't make sense. Same thing really with the letters that happened to show up after Lynn died. When were those turned over? Again, rhetorical question. I even listen to how you talk about the will and the wills and how this whole test thing with Anthony. Here's the thing. The initial will that was submitted to Judge Maxwell was typewritten and witnessed by strangers at a bank. And didn't leave it to Jesse. But guess what? The new will left it to Jesse and there were some issues with it. You want us to believe that Lynn Hernan changed her will and didn't follow the same procedure that she did for the will that was initially admitted into probate and what stood. By the way, a will can't be witnessed by the beneficiaries. Would never have worked. And there's a reason for that. (laughs) So this doesn't happen. She were that suicidal and making all of these plans to kill herself and change her will, Lynn Hernan was smart enough to know how to do it the right way if, in fact, she was the one to do it. You have someone draft it, and you have neutral witnesses, like she did the first time. You go to a bank. You get it notarized. Because, once again, the best predictor of future action is past action. If she did it the right way the first time, she's probably going to do it right the right way the second time because she knows how to. Some people just don't know how to do it, and then they may mess up. But when you know how to do it, why would you not do it the right way the second time? That's not what she did. There are a lot of holes in your version of events. And here's the thing. I didn't get the ability, nor did the jury, to have your story tested for its veracity. You have the absolute right at a trial not to testify. And there are pros and cons to doing so. You claim to regret not testifying. Also a move judges don't like. Because there's so many colloquies, so many chances, so many discussions with lawyers defendants should really know their rights when they say, I'm not going to testify or they decide to testify. Now, of course, you're going to regret anything if you lose, right? Maybe not. Maybe Murdoch doesn't regret testifying. But if you lose, you regret a lot of the moves you make during trial. You never know. What was the one thing that could have changed it? But again, I feel like Jesse Krzyzewski is acting like it was kind of an unfair part of the system that she wasn't able to testify. And if only she would have known or been treated fairly, then maybe she would have. And that's a big regret she has, as if it's, again, someone else's fault and not her own. But the jury didn't get to hear that. That was your choice. That's not on me. That's not on the state. That's on you. The other thing I want to comment on, you want us to believe that you and your mom were so close to Lynn Herman that you loved her and cared for her more than anybody else. And yet you unabashedly throw her under the bus and impugn her character with these wild stories. You want us to believe that she killed herself because she killed her mom in the same way that she was killed. And again, poisoning oneself with Visine, drops would be the last way someone would commit suicide. So they, again, they love this person so much, and then they say that she murdered her own mom, which is just crazy. Um, she talks a lot about Lynn. She goes into more about how this is about the victim and honoring the victim and punishing you as the defendant. Um, but I, I also thought that she talks a lot about punishment, but also I really respect the way she talks about, you know, some potential redeeming qualities that Jesse may have which not all defendants do, not all judges recognize it, even if defendants do. So I appreciate that she did. It might be very small, maybe very slight, but at least recognize the redeeming quality. 
Hopefully she continues to work on that when she throws her in prison. Um, and maybe this would be the push and the affirmation that she needed. Who knows? But I'm glad I'm personally glad she said it, no matter how mad and despicable I think her actions were in this case. It's a roof over my head, however you describe it in those moments. I think you thought you were a very good thief and that you've well, let me go back. So I don't want you to walk out of here thinking, I don't think you have any redeeming qualities. I mean, obviously, while in the jail. I think you tried to do what you can to make the most of unfortunate circumstances at your own hand. You obviously very diligently review all of the discovery materials. You do what you can to do your own research, to educate yourself. You help other inmates. I think you were blessed to have maybe some additional money coming in on your canteen and you uh, will help individuals who don't have any. I don't even frankly care what the motives are, whether they're purely good motives or if there's a pecking order back there, I don't I don't know. But I do know you have you made a friend and she, said some very nice things about you today. Honestly, the only person. I was really hoping to hear more from your mom about you. I have a lot in the PSI, in the private PSI about that. But your mom spent every moment of her statement attacking everyone else in this courtroom and Lynn. Whereas Ms. McCarthy came in, is what we hope for and expect of character witnesses to tell me more about this other side. Because I, I do believe people are multifaceted. People have- And why she's talking about this is in sentencing. Yes, the facts. Are, are very important. She talks about the deceit and the deception and the prior felonies, prior crimes, prior uh, screwing up when she's on probation, um, stealing thousands of dollars. All of those things enhance sentences. Those are bad. Trying to cover stuff up, not taking responsibility. But when people come at sentencing, you lost, you're getting sentenced, you're getting prison time. There's no way around it. You're not going home. But when people talk about your redeeming qualities, what you've done good since then, even like Ethan Crumbly talked about how he's been trying to be a better person. He knows he's a horrible, despicable person. He knows he's in prison the rest of his life. He's still going to try to be a better person. That's what sentencing is really about when you've already been convicted. Same thing with Ruby Frankie. She's guilty, so she's trying to focus on the future and how she's getting better. It may all be BS, but that's what judges want to hear. That's what state attorneys want to hear. And that's what Judge Doro is saying. She wishes more people would have come up and spoken like her jailhouse buddy who said she's been nice in prison. She has redeeming qualities. Seems like nobody else did that. I was blaming everybody else. But that's what sentencing about. That's This is a lesson on sentencing. Many sides. Even in the worst cases, like a homicide, there are redeeming qualities. And she told us about those. And I thank her for doing that. About how you took her under your wing. You kind of developed this relationship. You had lunch together, meals together, prayed together, did some studies together, and you helped her through a very trying time, as she said, being 70 and never incarcerated before. I'm sure that was not easy. And so I, I think there is a side to you that does care. I don't want you to think that I, I don't think you have a caring side. I mean, clearly you do. You cared for Scott Craig. You cared for his children. And in your own way, um, you made them feel important and loved. Now, there was another. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit more. Uh, Judge Doro is going to talk about how nobody really believed your stories. Nobody. Six different versions of events. And not one really making a whole lot of sense. You yourself admit, I lied. You should not be shocked, Ms. Krzyzewski, that people don't believe the stories that you tell. Once again, when you start admitting that you're a lying liar who lies, like Murdoch and a lot of other cases, it's really hard to bring that back around. It's just another example of a defendant lying, admitting lying, thinking that, well, if I tell the truth and admit that I lied, they'll believe the next thing I say, when it's not really usually how it works. They don't add up. They don't make sense. They fly in the face of logic. They are far too convenient and most often have extra detail added after you're given information from law enforcement, as if you went back to your cell, how can I explain this away? And I think you rely far too much on your intelligence and your ability to think on your feet, thinking you can outsmart, outsmart law enforcement. And the thing is, they're gonna look at everything. They're gonna uncover everything that they can. I think that those smirks and marks and shaking of the head really tick Judge Doro off. You want everyone in this courtroom to believe you should not have been convicted because law enforcement didn't look into the death of Lynn's mom. They didn't need to. They had enough evidence. The evidence was clear. It pointed directly to you. So there's Judge Doro's thoughts on the evidence and whether or not the jury got it right. But you had an opportunity 
I think many times to accept responsibility, to just admit, I think, I don't think you're able to do that. It's gotta be so hard for Judge Doro to do what she's about to do, watching the defendant act this way during sentencing. You're gonna stand firm on this was a suicide and no one will convince you otherwise. But you know what he did. You know you're the one that took Lynn Hernan from this earth. You know you're responsible because your own words say that to me. I knew she was drinking Visine. I helped her. I was filling up the bottles. I'm paraphrasing, I'm not gonna get it exactly right. But your story morphed to the point you admitted you knew Lynn Hernan was suicidal, that at one point she put a gun to her head and that she had been drinking Visine for months. If that were true, and you love this woman with your heart and soul and cared about her well-being, I believe Lynn Hernan would still be here because you would have gotten her help. You I'm going to jump ahead another minute just to keep it kind of rolling when she starts getting to the sentence. Having made up my mind on what to do in your case. And so listen to this. This is also interesting because a lot of people think judges walk in, they already know what they're going to do. The sentencing is just a show, a dog and pony show, and the judge gives the sentence that they walked in and already had prepared. Judge Doro said not so fast in this case. Do we believe her? When you hear her sentence, I really think I believe her, which is just wild to think that she left this door open and this is the door she took. After those expressions, after the testimony that did not take responsibility, after only one person talking about how she's redeemable, everybody else blaming other people. I know you think that I came into this courtroom today having made up my mind on what to do in your case. I don't want to tell you I didn't. I would go back and forth. Should I give her life without the possibility of extended supervision? Should I give her this eligibility at some point in time? I, I made myself a, a sheet. I had blanks for those things. And I knew what I wanted to do on the theft charges. I'll give you that, because they're pretty simple. They're 10 year felonies. The max is five years each, five initial confinement, five BS. And really the issue was, should they be consecutive or concurrent? And I'd go back and forth. I talked to my clerk, I'd say, I'm kind of struggling here. I want to find a reason. So just so you know, there's here today. the homicide and the two theft charges, two theft charges, she's going to get five years each, whether it's concurrent or consecutive. None of that really matters. She kind of gets to the punchline here. So we really know what Jesse Krzyzewski is looking at as a sentence. They're pretty darn compelling as to why there's no redeeming qualities. I listened to the state here today. They're pretty darn compelling as to why there's no redeeming qualities. Because that's the state's job here is to argue no redeeming qualities, life in prison without the possibility of parole. And that's what they argued for. That's what they asked for. And Attorney Jones said something really interesting during his sentencing remarks. You know, for everyone in this courtroom, the defendant, the defendant's family, to Mr. Poza, to his family, to all of Lynn's friends, even the detectives maybe, but probably less for that. This is the most important case. That's why you get people like Jim Kelleher saying, I don't like without the possibility of parole. And you get... Um, a request for leniency from those on your side. That's very typical. But what he said, what Attorney Jones said, and what he talked about is, we look at the system of justice. We have to look at the degrees of homicides. We have to look at the cases, really based on my experience, right, and other homicide cases, what's come through this county, and just generally kind of what we know in the justice system. That really kind of- And where does this fall on that scale to you guys? What do you think? I mean, to me, it's pretty horrible a vulnerable person who trusts and loves you and you take that and you smash it for money, for financial gain. I, mean, I think that's horrible. But if you look at the spectrum with the Ethan Crumbleys of the world and the Daryl Brookses of the world, it's definitely not on the absolute worst of the worst of society. But I don't really think it falls on like the lenient side either. It wasn't like an accidental killing by any means. Stuck with me. And he said to strip the defendant of any eligibility would be too harsh in this case. I'm paraphrasing. And that we should trust the system because it's not an automatic. All it is is an eligibility. And I do like, that's a really good argument by the defense attorney. Don't strip her of everything. And you're not automatically letting her out at any point. It's just like we talked about in the Frankie and Hildebrand case. Put her in front of somebody that's going to evaluate and determine whether or not she should be let out. Because if they still say no, and they still think she's a horrible, horrible human being whenever you think it's necessary that she has the possibility for parole, then she'll be in forever. And society doesn't have to worry. If she's still a danger, she'll stay in prison for the rest of her life. But at least give her the opportunity to be redeemed, to rehabilitate herself, to work to something. Give her some hope in prison. Give her some hope, some reason, some encouragement to be a better person. I gotta be honest, that's what I preach. So as bad as I think this is, I think I agree with it. I know a lot of you are not going to, but I think I agree with giving some kind of hope, 
for redemption and, and rehabilitation. And if it doesn't happen, which again, it might not. And if the past is any indicator of the future, it probably won't happen. Then she'll be in prison forever where she belongs. What do you think? I know you're roughly 40 years of age. I thought about making you eligible at 62 years, meaning 62 years of initial confinement. I thought, well, at 40, I don't know that, you know, I would put her in the triple. 102 digits. years old. And I thought about what others have said in terms of, you know, you're less of a risk when you get older, especially if you're in your 70s, 80s, whatever. And I don't want to, you know, unduly depreciate the seriousness of you taking the life of another person. And even though I think you're completely diabolical, and I think this was planned, and I think you have evil in your heart. You're completely diabolical, this was planned, and you have evil in your heart. I mean, so Judge Doro believes Jesse Krzyzewski is the worst of the worst. But she believes even the worst of the worst, depending on the crimes they commit, should still have the possibility of parole if it's a crime like this. Not a Daryl Brooks crime, not an Ethan Crumbly type crime. When I look at what else I've seen through my tenure, when I think of the system as a whole, I think this is one of those cases that it would not unduly depreciate the seriousness of the offense to make you eligible for extended supervision at some point. So then the question becomes, at what point? So she's made the decision to not give her life without the possibility of parole. She's just told her that. If I'm Attorney Jones, I'm feeling pretty good. That's a win for a defense attorney. I think for me, it's important to think about how old Lynn was when her life was cut short. She was 62. Under the statute, the earliest I could consider eligibility is 20 years. Now, this is not what I would call minimums eligibility case. So basically, she's looking at 20 years to 60 years. That's her range. And she says... This ain't a minimum type of case. So it's not going to be 20 years because she would only be 60 years old, younger than Lynn when she took Lynn's life. So that's not happening. So what does she land on? You have a prior record for four felonies. You've been to prison previously. You've been revoked twice while on extended supervision. You have issues with conforming your conduct to the rules and expectations that are placed upon you by the justice system. However, it's your first violent offense. You don't have a history of harming people. Uh, physically assault behavior, certainly not a prior homicide. Yeah. Not even like an OWI homicide or anything. You just have that prior OWI first. Knowing that I believe consecutive sentences or those thefts are important, and I'll get to the reasoning why. On the first degree intentional homicide charge, count one, I'm going to impose a life sentence with the possibility of extended supervision after 30 years. That would make you. So she's 40. So 30 years means she could possibly get out at 70. My dad's past 70, still lives a pretty good life. Can play golf, can play pickleball, can travel, can work, still sharp, still physically active, thank God. 70 ain't the end of the road. I mean, we heard in Murdoch, they're going to go play golf when Murdoch gets out when he's 70, according to Jim Griffin. So, I mean, to think that you took someone's life like this and you can get out at 70, but that's not where Judge Doro stops without the theft charges, close to 70 years of age, older than what Lynn would be today. Physically older, I think 30 years is a pretty significant amount of time. But my target is really 80 for you. That is why on counts two and three, you're going to serve maximum sentences consecutive to count one and consecutive to each other. Because I think to do anything other than that, given your prior forgery and misappropriation, <coughs> felony convictions and your lack of a good track record while on extended supervision would be to unduly depreciate the seriousness of those offenses. But I really looked at this and my goal here was to kind of hit that target. And that's how I structured it. And that target being to make you eligible closer to a point in time when you are 80 years of age. So what does she do? So basically the priors are not violent crimes, which is the main one she's convicted of, but they are similar to the theft crimes where you lie, cheat, and steal to get money. And you did it again. So you don't learn and you haven't learned. So if it was just those crimes, you'd get the max, which is five years each and consecutive. So that's 10 years. So she says, you absolutely get that. But I'll be a little bit more lenient with a first type of kind of offense of homicide, as horrible as it is. So she ends up going 30 plus 10 
basically 40 years. So if she's going to get out on parole, she's 80. Now, 80 is maybe the new 70 or 60. I mean, people aren't just automatically dead at 80. But 40 years is a long time. 80 is pretty old. I guess people can be president at that age. As crazy as that sounds. But still gives her some slight hope. But she ain't going to go have a full life at 80 years old. She has the possibility to get out. I mean, a lot of people do pass before then. So maybe she will pass in prison. I think it's a great sentence. I think it makes complete sense. I think it's perfectly harsh enough. And if she doesn't learn and she doesn't rehabilitate herself in there, she'll stay in there forever. She has a pretty good chance of passing in there. Obviously, life's not as easy in prison as it is outside of prison. So I like the sentence personally. I think it gives honor to the victim. I think it gives hope of rehabilitation in our system. I think it's not going to be easy for her. I think if she doesn't rehabilitate, she's absolutely staying in. And she doesn't have hope of some great life that she took from the victim. But let me know in the comments. I'm sure some of you are going to disagree, and that's perfectly fine. Respectfully, I'd like to know why and just what your thoughts are on the system and how it works and some judges that just don't throw the book at everybody and hope for the best for some people, but obviously plan for the worst based on past action. I really want to know what you guys think about it. Now, Pat, the next few minutes, she's going to get into some of the money and and some other comments that I found really interesting here before we uh, finish. I think the criteria that I have when I think about the, not just the seriousness, seriousness of the offense, but the need to protect the public, that's one of the key factors here as well. You've demonstrated that not only for family members and people that you love, but other strangers, like the your prior record shows with the patients from the clinic at which you worked and the mom of the person you lived with, there's really not anyone who's safe from you when it comes to your willingness to steal, to defraud. You'll craft fake documents, you'll try to cover up your tracks, you'll justify it, and then you'll blame others in the process when you get caught. But there's other things I need to go through in terms of the sentencing, um, in terms of conditions for extended supervisions and, and conditions of your sentence. Obviously, there's a, some things I need to go through through the statute, but I'll go through them. You have to provide a DNA sample. If you've not previously done so, there's DNA surcharges on all three counts, 250 each. We're going to skip payment court costs for diligence as set forth in the uh, memorandum to set up an escrow account um, under 949.1. So she's going to set up an escrow account for money she may get, and there's going to be more on that later that I find really interesting. The money that me finds an order. There's no doubt in the court's mind that homicide and felony theft are serious crimes under sub one in 949.165, and that the estate of Lynn Hernan, represented by the personal representative, Anthony Poza, are victims under 950.02 sub four. Not only is- Talk about why that's important, because they have to be officially victims in order to collect and have certain rights. As any condition of her sentence and extended supervision, but it's to be paid before costs or fines. And these financial obligations shall be collected pursuant to state statute and is provided with that escrow account that I'm setting up as well. She's to have absolutely no contact with Anthony Poza or any family members of his. She's to not gamble or have any contact at any casino. She's not to possess another. Because she's had a gambling problem in the past and use that as kind of an excuse for some of her actions. Person's personal identifying information, including but not limited to a driver's license, social security number or card, credit card or number, etc. She has to have no employment or service as a caregiver, whether paid or unpaid. She's to complete all other programming as deemed appropriate by the- Makes sense, obviously, based on the actions of her crime. So I like this. I like the specificity. I like all this stuff that if she were to ever get out at 80 or even past 80, none of this stuff's happening again. We're protecting the community from what her vices are and what she has proven to do to hurt people in the past. That's why this is a great lesson on sentencing for us to watch together in a real case streamed live for a judge who knows transparency is important and people learn and are fascinated by our legal system. I love it. I love it. Department of Corrections. Within 48 hours of this hearing, she is to notify her attorney, meaning Attorney Jones, of the location of Lynn Herman's remains. You hear that? She's forced to tell Attorney Jones what is the location of the victim's remains so the victim's family can actually get it. And guess what? She says it right now, and you may be surprised where they are. 48 hours of that notification, those remains are to be turned over to the state of Wisconsin by their victim witness, who shall then turn them over to Anthony Koza.
Yes, my, my clients indicated that her mother's in possession of those remains. Her mother has the remains, who testified at sentencing, blaming everybody else. So the judge is like, court order right now, mom's got to turn them over. We know of them. Jennifer Flowers in the hallway. Walks County District Attorney's Office. Um, order. All right, thank you. I, I wanted to um, say a couple of acknowledgements to Mr. Poza, his mom, and the rest of Lynn's friends. And I know that at times this has been frustrating. I appreciate the sentiment here earlier today, but I, I hope I did my best to bring this case to a conclusion and that by, and through this case, this trial, and today that you can finally have some closure and begin healing. I know that it's frustrating. It's frustrating for a lot of people, whether it be a defendant or a victim, to go through a court process. It doesn't always go as quickly. And as one thing I will agree with the defendant is that it is going through a court case and a trial is nothing like what you see portrayed in a dramatization. I often tell juries that, that you cannot get try a case and get a verdict in an hour. That's drama. And the rules of evidence often... So sometimes law and order in the movies are wrong, right? It's, it's a pretty cool here. I mean, hit the like button. And let me know in the comments if you feel like you have really learned a lot in this hearing about real world, not real world, what streaming's like, law and order TV. Like, this is it. There are some things, like I said, that can be very real analogies to real life and real cases. And some where they have the whole case tried in one hour, and it's not like that. Or the week after a crime is committed, we're at trial. It just never happens like that. And we know that now. Everybody that gets to watch this stuff with lawyers or without, you're understanding what it's like in the real world and you can call out in movies and shows. That could happen, that couldn't. And it, I think it's cool. Technology. Sometimes prevent certain things from coming in that one party or the other might want in. And the flip side of that is sometimes it allows for questioning that may seem intrusive and violative. And I appreciate everyone's patience. Um, as we went through this process, you know, I, I would remind everyone, I mean, the case was filed in 2021. There needed to be a preliminary hearing. That was ultimately, um, once we got through the arraignment process and the case came before me, we had a trial scheduled in relatively short order for February of 2023. And then uh, there was a request by the defense for an adjournment. And with reluctance, I granted that. And originally we had uh, parts of six weeks needed to be scheduled, depending on my perspective. Everyone Talk about all the delays between what about happened. That work jury pool, um, some respect. Um, I found my note that I wanted to reference earlier, and I know I've pronounced settings, but when I talked about THZ and what it does to a person and why I believed in the series of events that I've described and um, how it was utilized in this case and why I believe there's, you know, evidence to support it being used for quite some time is that it impairs memory, it impairs judgment, it impairs inhibitions. It's a substance not routinely screened for and certainly not in 2018. It's a widely available over the counter. It's not a recreation. Again, she does this. She's done this a couple of times, which we heard how it, how it's like the perfect drug to be used by a defendant like Jesse Krzyzewski. I think it was a Tony Sisberger. No, Lynn Hernan was left to die on her own. What I wrote is this, that she was dosed and the defendant left her to die alone. Why leave? If not a homicide, he needed a window of opportunity to claim when Hernan committed suicide. You know, the, the, the conviction and the homicide story lines up and makes sense. The suicide and the defendant's story is totally illogical and makes no sense. The jury saw it, the judge saw it, the public saw it that watched this trial. The jury got it right. It was tough. I thought our lawyers had some arguments they could make. Um, but at the end of the day, I think the lies, the deceit, it all just made more sense. There was motive. Um, and I think that's why the jury came down the way that they did. It wasn't exactly like an open and shut easy case. But I do think the way it was presented, it made sense. I just want to make a further record that while I didn't reference it with specificity in my sentencing remarks, I obviously had referenced kind of generally uh, the PSI, the private PSI certainly relied upon those and getting background information for uh, Ms. Kershusky, uh, referenced um, my reference to the 20 years was obviously to the private PSI as well. Uh, the state's PSI uh, did not make any specific recommendation on the homicide otherwise, other than noting its life, um, that's mandatory life under the statute, and then made a recommendation that I deviated from or at least did not agree with as to counts two and three. I do want to state with some specificity the restitution that I ordered. I gave the total amount, but it's broken down as follows. Uh, for funeral expenses, $3,707.48. For the personal representative, representative's fee, $2,947. 
for the cash withdrawals and checks from the estate checking account, $54,689.53. That's what she stole. For payment from the estate to inheritance funding, $14,000. The payment from Croak, Gonzalez, Eckerly, and Martinson in the amount of $4,700. I'm going to skip through some of these where she's just like reading off numbers with the what the restitution is, but I do want to discuss together what she thinks about whether or not there's a possibility that she pays any of this back. 36 cents and a penny. Um, I'll find that uh, this total amount of restitution has been established by clear and convincing evidence uh, based upon the trial exhibits and testimony and as set forth in the attached supporting documentation in document number 61. I don't know if you're in a position to tell me that today. Right. Reference, uh, and I will. Like I'm sure you have, I'm going to argue. And what I believe um, is a very real possibility. I argue. I will speak more on a part three. I obviously ordered that escrow account. And what I believe um, is a very real possibility when you look at the present and future earning ability of the defendant, I'm certainly aware that uh, organizations such as Law and Crime, Core TV, um, 48 Hours, um, I believe also AARP, all intend or have expressed interest in the records or writing articles or other things. I believe there's a very real likelihood or possibility uh, for um, there to be potential income flowing to Ms. Kershevsky as it relates to her story. That's why I um, ordered the escrow account. And so she knows court TV, law and crime, 48 hours, AARP might be writing stories, doing things that might generate income for the defendant based on her actions in this case and her story. And what are we going to do with that money? We're going to give it to the victims. We're going to pay back the costs to the citizens that had to spend money prosecuting and defending this case. That's the right thing to do. And what's also crazy is just when judges start to have a full picture of how all this works, allowing cameras, law and crime, court TV, whatever, generating interest in a story when they know that the public is interested in it. And if you don't have the you know son of Sam laws and defendants can potentially profit off of their conviction and their horrible things that they do. Well, if you start creating systems that make sure, or I shouldn't say make sure, but maybe start creating opportunities for victims to actually collect restitution for states and, and citizens to, to collect restitution on money that they've spent, taxpayer dollars and victim damages from the criminal justice system. Because it's very, very few victims' compensation funds are actually well-funded where victims get what they deserve. Sometimes we can get it in civil court if the defendant has money or if there's insurance and things like that. But many times we can't. But if the interest in these cases can fund restitution and can fund repaying the citizens for money they've, I don't want to say wasted because the criminal justice is really important, but spent because of horrible actions of defendants, is that a good side effect from the technology and the interest in the streaming of these trials? I don't know. Is it a bad thing to put more pressure and, and, and things on it to maybe create funds at the end? I don't know. It's an interesting discussion point. I'm not saying she had this planned or anything, but if it happens, why not put it towards the right cause? So I, I considered that. Um, obviously, she has no dependents, so that I don't need to consider sub four. Um, I've obviously considered the total loss suffered by any victim. Uh, I've gone through that. Um, I'm well aware she really has no financial resources at this time, but I do believe there's a very real potential uh, based upon the public and media interest in this case. Um, I also take into consideration that even with such a significant amount of restitution ordered and the way the statute reads about the payment of, of costs and restitution from prison monies, there's a cap on that. Um, and it's not... Um, something I would deviate from in this case. I think it's appropriate. Um, and um, so I've considered that as well. Then I'm not requesting an additional hearing. All right. Um, anything else from you at this time? And then I'll turn to the state. No, you're not. I know I have a few warnings to get through and all of that. But before I get through that, is there anything the state has? Yeah, we are in the process of filing that order for the production of Lynn Hernan's remains. And then we'll obviously uh, keep the court informed of when that's served on Ms. Wallace. All right. All right. All right. So that, for all intents and purposes, is the end of sentencing. I mean, eye-opening, some mind-blowing comments, some harsh comments, some merciful actions. It had everything a sentencing hearing should have, in my opinion. Um, I can't wait to read the comments that you guys have, uh, but I, I enjoyed it. I learned something every time we watch a hearing, every time we watch sentencing. I love learning about the law. I love seeing how different judges do it, how different lawyers argue. 
Um, some things you can expect, some things you can't. But I appreciate you guys joining me as always. Please hit that like button and subscribe to our channel if you guys haven't already. We're continuing to grow. We're continuing to add voices and different people to bring their perspectives, which I love and I think helps the learning process. Um, so I appreciate you guys so much joining me here, um, uh, engaging, discussing, asking questions, giving comments. I always appreciate that so much. Um, but that's all we got. Till next time, I'm out of here. Thanks for watching another episode of The Lawyer You Know. If you enjoyed the episode, please hit the thumbs up and share with your friends who may be interested here on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. And don't forget to check out The Lawyer You Know podcast with new seasons dropping every quarter. If you have a case you want to talk to us about, if it's a personal injury case, wrongful death, catastrophic injury, car accident, or slip and fall case, please email us at lawyeryouknow at gmail.com. And of course, all these links I just mentioned are included in the description below on this episode and every episode. So until next time, this is Peter Tregos, The Lawyer You Know.